So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the next part of the event. That is the panel on reflections and steps to come. We've heard throughout the morning, you know, the first block, all the lessons learned. And there were some very rich discussions in the um, work groups to reflect on those questions. And now we have a very uh, interesting panel that will be moderated by Carl Brook and myself. We have very interesting guests for this panel. Gloria Estela Lopez, chair of the CSJ, the Superior Council of the Judiciary. We have Juan Carlos Lozada, a chamber representative, Valeria Idan Bergum from the Norwegian uh, Embassy, and Olga Lucia Patitin, who is the appointed park prosecutor for environmental and agricultural affairs in Colombia. So before we begin with this panel and the presentations, each panel will have some time, some 10 minutes to present, and then there'll be a closing dialogue. I'd like to ask Carl and hear from his perspective how he has seen the lessons learned, the discussions that have taken place in the groups and how they place us in a very productive land for the coming presentations. Thank you. And I think some of my comments will probably reinforce uh, what we heard in the reporting back. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about all of this is that I've, I've worked in a lot of conflict affected countries. Right now, uh, uh, Miguel and Angela and others are working with me on a three year judicial training program in partnership with the Consejo Superior de la Judicatura. And I am incredibly impressed by how much capacity is in Colombia. The human capacity, the institutional capacity, the infrastructure. And I think that this comes back to a point that Alberto Gomez made in the opening panel and we've talked about recently, and that is the importance of political will. There is a lot of capacity to do what's right. Sometimes there are problems about people not knowing what the law is, but often, often they do know, but there aren't consequences. So there is uh, there's an incentive, an economic and social incentive to do what you want. Um, one of the things I think is so interesting about the conference yesterday and today is the number of different initiatives and learning that we see at different levels. Um, there was a lot of discussion yesterday about work at the community level not legal, much more social, some economic, some legal. Um, and uh, the, there's always this question of how do we proceed bottom up? How do we proceed top down? And how do we have these initiatives meet? Um, and so there's a lot of questions about how do we integrate? But what, the other thing that I want to highlight here is I've seen a lot of innovations. Um, some of the things that we're hearing about respecting property rights of indigenous persons. This is standard stuff. This is not new. But we do see a lot of interesting tools and approaches, some of them using uh, psychology, some of them using economic approaches to try to improve uh, environmental governance at different levels. And I, I wanted to um, acknowledge that. And uh, coming as we move forward, uh, um, we will be producing a an edited book that pulls together a lot of this learning uh, that will be led by uh, Angela Amaya, Erica Weinthal, and Christine Perry. I think I'll stop my comments there. I'm really interested in hearing what the participants have to say. Uh, Miguel, back to you. Okay, Miguel. 
Okay, thank you. Gloria Estela Lopez is there, right? She's here with us. Hello, good afternoon, one welcome to this meeting. This is our first speaker, Gloria Estela Lopez, chair of the CSJ, the Superior Council of the Judicature. Good morning to everyone, everyone who's joined this meeting of the first steps and reflections on governance for peace in Colombia. I want to thank Carl, the Director of International Programs from ELI in the US. It's important that this project that is framed in, within international cooperation with CSJ and the State Council and all of that to bring efforts together to improve the capacities, the response capacity of judges and to hear those cases so they know how to hear it and decide on these cases dealing with deforestation in Colombia during this training. Well, it'll be interesting for some judges, especially in the most impacted areas by this phenomenon in Colombia. We'll be bringing magistrates from other districts, additionally, uh, auxiliary magistrates and auxiliaries from the court who will be participating in this um, training course given by experts that is so important to us. This conference cycle will be held into three stages. The first cycle of uh, training sessions you know of is uh, a form of the law, judicial orders and its execution, and finally, citizen participation. We know that we have had representatives, I think Mr. Lusa is here, uh, representative uh, to the chamber. They're discussing this environmental law bill. The State Council and the Supreme Court has participated here in this discussion and we have presented several proposals to make it successful because it's so important to Colombia, especially to enforce the um, peace agreement and we want to achieve uh, political participation, achieve the end of conflict, everything related to the implementation of the agreement itself and the reparation of victims. What we want to do is this understand comprehensive uh, environmental law in a comprehensive manner to apply in the region, especially what has been adopted. We know the most important point of the regional agreement on the environment, the origin was the uh, Conference of the United Nations on Sustainable Development. And we committed to several activities. First, to you respect the rights to people, the right of each person to live in a healthy environment, protect human rights, and adapt all necessary measures, regulatory, legislative, administrative measures, everything that we can in the judicial power to guarantee the implementation of the agreement. Plus, everything about this right environment for people and to protect and promote the environment and the recognition of those, or that protection guarantee the right to have access to justice in all environmental matters. That's why in the proposals we have at Congress on environmental law, the reform to environmental law is to create this chamber or this specialty, if you wish, so that we can comply with that agreement and uh, make sure that it's in the national legislation, all the legal instances so that they can uh, appeal and resort and have access to those decisions to protect and sort out the issues on environmental matters and any decisions can maybe appeal properly. So if it's adverse to the environment and pass all the laws that seek that protection, facilitate access to justice for us at the CSJ, whenever it's defined by Congress, 
on the creation of this specialty on agriculture and the environment. We will do all the we'll take all the necessary actions to guarantee that they are trained, the judges are trained and properly appointed. We need to have the competent bodies for access to specialized knowledge on the environment. So with this that we're beginning even now, as you may know well, we did very important training sessions. If you did not know, all judges, uh, land judges, that have some re important relation to environmental law and judicial decisions. We carried out last year a very nice training session for all land magistrates and judges because of the relation and the importance of the decisions they have, the decisions they make have on land restitution to those that were dispossessed during the armed conflict. Also, this a uh, guarantee of the rights of peasants, workers, who have a special protection for us. From our viewpoint, this is something that is a national development plan and they need to be their rights, to have their rights guaranteed and to have the right protection, see if they are vulnerable people and with greater celerity from the uh, judicial organs. We need to highlight something very important because I know I have very little bit of time. So, if we don't highlight this, we would lose an important opportunity for the Superior Council. I mean, uh, re recogni recognition of the special indigenous jurisdiction and the autonomy of indigenous people. So, last year, we, in October, we conducted the national encounter, well, the national gathering of indigenous peoples and the environment. This is very important. We have social cultural reflections and, and juridical ones about motherland, re, uh, rights of nature, and especially the progress in jurisprudence in this area and legal progress through the decisions by the Congress of the Republic. Okay, well, so there were uh, international speakers back then, and we saw the, the evidence between the vision of indigenous people up in, on land, the vision they have about land, different from, from other people's visions, equality of nature and acknowledging of rights. We still, we don't see it like that. We need to learn from them. So this exercise was really good. It alert, it, it, it became an, an alert and we learned about the importance with the connection with motherland and what high courts have been doing, pushing this important change, the important way of seeing land and territories and ecosystems. They, it was defined that they are subjects of rights and we need to respect the environment and the planet. So those decisions have contributed a lot in what was related to uh, Adrato River uh, acknowledgement of rights and the Amazon acknowledgement of rights. So the judicial uh, branch, we have in, in, implemented this learning, but we know that with this training, we will be able to deepen into these topics and we will have better training for judges when they need to resolve on environmental manners or, and um, with the creation of this special jurisdiction, we will improve access to justice and we will guarantee conservation and respect of the environment. That's as, uh, what we want to propose as corporation so that we can make this a reality so that we, I mean, everything that is related to access to justice and that specialty judges have to have when they, def when they define or when they resolve on topics that didn't, that, um, that before they were not so demanding, let's say. So we are just acknowledging this. We conducted important uh, activities in 2020 and with the magistrate and with the judicial school. And so this training for judges, magistrates and uh, employees, employees in general that contribute with decisions. 
the vice president of uh, council, Marta Lucia now, and the idea is to continue with this high level academic training to uh, approach uh, reforestation processes when we have in, in judicial matters. So, so you have our commitment and the support of uh, the Superior Council of the Judicature. We would, I would like to thank you for this opportunity and external university. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Gloria. For us, it is an honor to be able to support and in, in capacity building. I invite you to stay with us a little longer. I, I see that uh, Mr. Lozada is connected. I would like to uh, welcome uh, Juan Carlos Lozada, rep is a representative before the chamber. Yeah, and yes. It's, you are working on some topics there in Congress, like environmental jurisdiction, uh, criminal code. So for us, it would be a pleasure to hear your presentation. Welcome. Thank you so much, Miguel. It is a pleasure to be here with you to say hello to everyone. A special uh, greetings to Carl. It is so nice to see you again and to Miguel and many of you we have been able to share through these virtual means, share this uh, uh, pro uh, project to reform of the penal, uh, the criminal code uh, that Gloria just mentioned. I would like to say greetings to you too, Gloria, to Olga Lucia uh, as well. She was uh, recently appointed, so greetings to her as well, and the other panelists and Oleg as well. Well, well, I would like to start my intervention probably backwards from what I had planned because of the comments I heard from Gloria Stella. Okay, I was going to start with more general topics and then go to specific topics that in this case, it would be legislation that is going through Congress in terms of uh, environmental matters. But I'm going to go backwards and I'm going to make a couple of comments about what Gloria mentioned. First of all, about the creation of agrarian specialty. I think that is great progress in terms of implementing the agreement and those guarantees citizens must have so that somehow we can take juridical controversies of that rural Colombia. So we, we, we were concerned, it, it was, we, we got hurt because it was halfway, it was not completed because environmental issues were excluded from that, the creation of that agrarian specialty. In Congress, I had this alternative proposal versus uh, Juanita and, and Mr. Andrade versus their proposal. They did not in, agree. They didn't want to include environmental issues in the agrarian jurisdiction. Unfortunately, it, 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 that project was built by the Ministry of Justice in the, back when Margarita Cabello used to be the Minister of Justice. It is a shame it, it was not included. Those the, the first the first I mean the last the last six delegate uh, progress just like uh, the Supreme Court is Court of Justice they all agreed that it was a waste of time and it was a waste of an opportunity a historic opportunity to be able to include environmental issues into the agrarian specialty so since we were halfway. We are halfway right now. We have this need to start thinking about a specialty. Besides the agrarian specialty, we need to have an environment, environmental specialty. That's a serious error because we are agrarian and rural as Colombian. And agrarian controversies cannot be separate from environmental controversies. Agrarian specialty contemplated the possibility for judges in that specialty get to know about environmental issues 
only when it is absolutely necessary to solve a controversy, a rural controversy in terms of land tenure or in terms of land use but they cannot know about environmental cases when they are not referred in agrarian cases. I think that's a great mistake, great error. We missed this great opportunity and I was very sad. And um, I believe that we, we're gonna have to start working there in Congress along with the ministry, uh, hopefully with the attorney's office and of course, to, to be able to have an environmental specialty. We need to think about that law that goes for the agrarian specialty. So that was one first point. Well, and then now I, I'm gonna start where I should have started. And this, the most serious problem in environmental issues is no doubt linked to land tenure in our country. Cause number one for deforestation in Colombia and homicide of environmental leaders in Colombia is no doubt land tenure. So we have the, that, that study new witness that how 64 environmental leaders that were killed in 2019 45 of them died because of land tenure. Half of them were, they belonged to indigenous communities. That is so serious. And we know in our country that deforestation, probably the worst thing in Colombia, so when, when we get the last uh, figures by IDEAM, probably if the deforestation would have increased 30%, more than 67% of that deforestation is in the Amazon region in our country. So that deforestation is absolutely linked to land tenure. It is incredible. Dear prosecutor and dear president, it is incredible that in the past years, the Amazon region, we have more, almost 100,000 hectares and the agency has not recovered one square kilometer of those hectares, nothing out of 600,000. So that's why we in this project to reform Title 11 of the criminal code, it refers to environmental crimes. We have not only created that deforestation crime promotion and financing of deforestation so that we can go after those who benefit from a gathering land. But we have also created that crime to those, those uh, criminals from a state. It is not possible that those people in this country just keep land to themselves and that has no consequences. There must be legal mechanisms used today to legalize taking land in our country. That is unforgivable because that's what root number one, cost number one is there for degradation. So we need to fight. I am very critical of the national government and I need to acknowledge here the coordination that we have had in the last months between the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Environment, of course, with the General Attorney's Office, of course, with the Army and along with local authorities so that we can hit those criminal bands that are taking lands to themselves and they are taking all primary forests to themselves. So that was one of the first ideas that I went to national government was to create that committee, that institutional coordination committee of more than 25 institutions that should have been coordinated against the forestation because that lack of coordination coordination allowed for bandits and criminals to take land to them for themselves. That coordination is not easy. It is very complex to get. We need to have social dialogue, 
are enormous. Look at Mapiripan, three million pesos, Miguel, three million pesos per uh, those uh, hectares. That in some areas is five million pesos per hectare deforested. Who can take 25,000 in eight, in just in one municipality? that is called Minipinipan, who can pay for that? Criminal bands, criminal groups, extreme violence, and that is danger, high danger for everyone. And they have created some boundaries in certain part of the country where employment creation is because of destruction, not because of the state and not because of the economic possibilities of those communities. So we need to stand there and we, and I have, I have heard uh, here in the, in the panel to listen to many difficulties that we have to have social dialogues with communities in those areas where there is social conflicts and environmental conflicts. And there is no doubt, this is a key topic. This is a central topic. And I, I listened to an anthropologist from Humboldt Institute and he said, that in many of those spaces, state does not exist. So that's why there's no social contract, no social covenant, so that we can take care of nature. So in many of those territories, many peasants feels they are, um, they are hit by institutionality. They are not supported, but they are hit by institutionality. Okay, so here there is this need to create environmental specialty, yes, uh, strengthen um, sentences against those criminal groups, not against peasants in the country, but against criminal groups. But uh, we also need social dialogue to think about environmental legislation in our country. In many sectors in Colombia, it, 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 has, it is uh, past date, it is overdue. Let me give you an example of San Lucas Serrania. This is one great big part, this is, this is protected by law number two, but there is nothing there to protect there anymore. It has been devastated by illegal mining, deforestation, land taking, a cattle, African palm, and so many other cases. So there is a law to protect it, but there is nothing there to protect anymore. So we are going to need to create more dia more models that include dialogues so that we can give land to peasants but then protect what there is to protect and whatever there is left. So that dialogue needs to be done on the base to assigning or giving land with sustainable commitments, conserv conservation commitments in those areas where, where, where we, we cannot have mining or agriculture anymore. So that is a big challenge that I'm going to close with this. That's Colombia's challenge. We, it goes beyond, I agree with, with much that has been said here, it goes beyond an institutional design, it goes beyond environmental legislation, it goes beyond applying law, I think is the effort that local governments, national government has to make to come to conservation agreements with communities. And of course, those conservation agreements need to go through economic possibilities in terms of using our resources, but at the same time, there needs to be pedagogy by the state in this climate crisis that we have and in this environmental moment, momentum to save one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, ours. This is a blessing and that's why the, that's the reason why, Miguel, in Congress we have focused our agenda on environmental issues. I thank you so much for this opportunity to dialogue and I, I'll be here for any questions or comments in the, in the QA session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lozada. Okay, so now we are going to continue with Olga Lucia. She is the delegate prosecutor um, for agrarian issues. Do, do, uh, Olga, you're welcome. Hello, everyone. I uh, Let me introduce myself. I hadn't met you. For the prosecutor's office, this scenario is so useful and pertinent when we are in this process to implement the peace agreement. For us, 
it, it is not just this opportunity to be able to participate and, and, and to tell uh, citizens there was those reflections and viewpoints from the prosecutors within the implementation of uh, the agreement uh, related to environmental governance, but to collect all these reflections that you have done um, yesterday and today from different viewpoints and from the prosecutor's office, process them, make them visible and make them put a potential so that we can strengthen this process that needs strengthening. And I think that all of these uh, conferences and contributions from yesterday and today will be so good to strengthen the process. So I really thank the organizers for having invited us. We are very pleased to, to be here and let's take advantage of these uh, conference. Well, the reflection, I wanted to complement what has been said uh, by other panelists. There was, um, there was this opportunity that it was, it, I mean, it, we missed this opportunity to create this environmental jurisdiction. Uh, besides the arguments that were already presented, the great comprehensive rural reform that the peace agreement brought, its center and the key element is protection to the environment. They are completely linked. So rural reform, land tenure, from that social organization goes in linked, intricately linked with environmental protection. In those areas where we have our armed conflict, unfortunately, those were in those areas that have high level of conservation and environmental protection. So, uh, the community plays a big role. We need to strengthen uh, the, the community and how close they feel to the land so that they, the community, through their knowledge, those, those people who are in territories, they can contribute to the government so that public policies can be created for true conservation and true protection. We need to start from the fact that we need to have environmental zoning, dividing by zones, and that is done with whom? With community. Forest protection is done with whom? With communities. So in that sense, it was very sad that we could not, that the prosecutors uh, also supported getting the environmental jurisdiction within the agrarian project because like I said, they are linked. It's a marriage that cannot be broken. So we need to integrate this and that's what the prosecutor's office is fighting for at this moment. And we are working on the articulation amongst all different institutions. We, we have uh, environmental authorities, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment. We need to have an articulation um, going forward in terms of this, okay. Well, environmental conservation. All right. Can I, I, I could continue talking, yes, but I, I, but they give us some instructions. So later I am going to, to, to uh, participate later. Yeah. You still have some, a few minutes, Olga, in case you have some other ideas. Oh, no, I have so many ideas here, but yeah, we're doing good. I mean, we're doing good. This is a topic that really pass, it's a, it's, you know, it makes me passionate. It has been a priority for the prosecutor's office. Important thing is to acknowledge that communities, com communities manage conservation. Communities manage these complex, complex tasks. So community needs to be at the core of everything. We cannot go we cannot go on and impose things. Communities need to be part of all those instruments and tools that the government is implementing. Like the representative before Congress mentioned, fight against deforestation has been a government plan and they are working closely 
CONALDES was created. This is the uh, National Council to Fight Deforestation. The prosecutor's office is an active member of that council. And all of these uh, institutions, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Interior, uh, the General Attorney's Office, they are doing such interesting work in, uh, to fight deforestation because they are they are hitting those criminal bands, criminal groups, extensive uh, cattle and, and other activities. They're, they're bringing deforestation to our country, but that's not enough. First of all, there is this weakness. The prosecutor's office has identified it and we are working on it with international cooperation, many projects, because we need to involve and we need to get to territory, we need to get to know territory, we need to know the social needs and we need to involve them in, this, in these processes. We need to have a weighing. We have social issues and the obligation by the state to fight those mobs, those illegal groups, but we need to know that those communities are weak they need to be strengthened and those communities could be affected by activities we conduct so we need to take care of them and that's a task we're going to fight for to see how we can integrate them and they cannot it cannot turn into a problem later right and so that we can actually comply with the purposes we all want thank you so much olga all right well, we have our last panelist, not, bec not, last, not because last is least. <laughs> so we, we have here from the uh, Norwegian, um, Norwegian Embassy. So you are here, welcome. Uh, so here all is, is welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, First of all, let me say hi to the panelists who are here today. To me, it is, an, it is a great honor to share this space with you. I would like to say greetings to GGGI and the Environmental Law Institute. Hello, greetings to you. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this event. Well, during this event, we have seen in some presentation, very interesting presentations, that there is this tight relationship between nature conservation and peace. In Colombia, this is a tangible reality that we can experiment every day. His voice is cutting. In, uh, in the country is in one of the first places of those list of greatest coverage of tropical forest with close to 60 million hectares. Those forests represent great hope for climate change mitigation at the global level. But we cannot see forests apart from economic, social, political dynamics in the country. As we will know, those areas with forests have been right there inside the history of a social of um, social development in Colombia. Colonization happened in Colombia for many years. Um, having farms and actually cutting down trees trees was prideful because it meant, oh, we, we were building, we're growing. So in the Amazon, there were many social processes that took place surrounding colonization. But those times have changed. Nowadays, natural forest logging is not accepted. However, we must acknowledge and other panelists have mentioned that many social environmental conflicts that exist today are tightly linked to land access and resource access. Deforestation decreases the possibilities for regions to develop and they affect indigenous peoples directly, peasants as well, African descendants that went from those resources. 
From the Norwegian cooperation, it is key that it is not possible to build environmental sustainability without building territorial governance first. For us, environmental rule of law is a synonym of good governance. It is a combination between efficient state, communities that can participate and manage their territory and the private sector that gives, that has, mm, it is potent for, for this engine. We have supported the country through several cooperation programs, the state, the civil society, different work fronts. And I would like to mention some of them. They have a relevance in this seminar. So since 2016, we have been uh, helping the Amazon vision uh, is, one of, is one of the most ambitious uh, programs in the country. And it proposes a new model for development there in the Amazon region. And that is to generate conditions for peace building creating econo sustainable economic opportunities and improving conditions of local communities. I believe that one of the great um, uh, steps in terms of progress is to have conserv effective conservation agreements with local communities, as well as sustainable business in the midterm they strengthened environmental authorities as well we expect that lessons learned in this program that required so much effort from all stakeholders can be taken uh, into use and can be used by the country in the future we also see that an important task is to strengthen institutions in charge of preventing, investigating, and utilizing environmental crimes linked to deforestation. This is urgent in Colombia, and that's why since last year, we started with this big cooperation to on UDC so that we can support 11 institutions, national and regional institutions with competences in these areas in prioritized regions in the country. Besides this, we have national and regional support programs, uh, the Sustainable Columbia Fund, and besides the projects that had already been mentioned directed to civil society. There are three topics that I would like to highlight as priority based on our experience with cooperation in Colombia in terms of uh, weather and forests in this year. First, the need to empower regional stakeholders a lot more. We see that in different regions, there are institutions and communities that can manage their own change processes towards sustainability. They need to be acknowledged and they need to be incorporated as process leaders. We also see that there's a lot of potential in some proposals that have been promoted by the government, such as conservation contracts. We believe that if they are well implemented, they can contribute to improve governance and development in regions. As we have already mentioned it, we believe that it would be a lot more effective for those agreements to be conducted collectively and not individually. Experience in other countries shows that if it's done that way, social control of territory is improved and institutional burden is reduced. Lastly, I would like to highlight the importance of dialogue, formal dialogue spaces, informal dialogue spaces between the government and communities. Other panelists mentioned this as well. Colombia has very interesting process, uh, progress. 
discussion spaces that have been institutionalized and have been strengthened throughout years. For example, dialogue tables with indigenous peoples. For us, those spaces guarantee that voices from territories are being heard. The rights are being respected. We want to promote, continue promoting so that these tables can continue happening and they can be strengthened with different communities and with different ethnic groups in the country. About legal proposals, I think that we are going to uh, we're going to talk about this after my intervention, but I stop here so that we can have the conversation all together in a short while. I thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Ole. Carl. Go ahead, Carl. Thank you all. This has been incredibly rich and I appreciate your um, uh, willingness to uh, um, keep your remarks relatively brief so we can have some discussion. We have some time now and we've had some very rich discussions uh, before this in breakout groups and I would like to open this to people to um, if they have questions uh, on your remarks or if you if they have uh, things that they would like to add. I see uh, Alex Castro has raised his hand and We'll start with him. Sorry. Thank you, Carl, very much. I'm gonna go in Spanish. I have a question for Mr. Lozada. I would like to know this, the status of interpartisan agreements about environment. I understand that there are different approximations because of parties, parties, but I would like to know about those common agreements because there are many things that are happening outside the political world between decision makers, there are discussions in the police, in the army, superior uh, council, in prosecutor's office, we have the credit of the World Bank, a hundred million dollars. So I think there's a lot of activities, but I would like to know the consistency between that, those activities and the world inside politics. Thank you, Mr. Lozada. Should I answer now? Thank you, Miguel. A very good question. Alex, thank you for that question. Probably it is difficult to answer. It, I mean, it is a complex question. It's not easy to answer. Well, um, in terms of political agreements that specifically focus on environmental issues, I cannot say that today we have minimum interpartisan agreements about environmental issues. They don't exist. Uh, that's unfortunate. I think that the responsibility that we have in Colombian state about cons the conservation of those vo uh, forests, like all I mentioned, are fundamental to, for sustainability in, of the planet in these times of climate crisis. In Colombia, they don't exist. The environmental agenda is is behind in political is is a second or third fourth level agenda. Uh, I would say that um, it is not a, it is not in the priorities of the legislative or the executive branch. Proof of this is that where there is confusion between land tenure and peace, what's outside is environmental, like what happened with the agrarian specialty. So the vision, the view several political sectors have on environmental issues is, uh, I would say, I would say that that vision would be, I, I don't know, a, a short sighted vision. I don't know. I mean, it's something the citizenship is interested in, but it still, it does not deserve attention from political parties as it should be. And for, well, 
um, however, those of us who are focused on the environmental agenda, we have come to agreements with the national government. So to reform chapter 11, environmental crimes, the president of the Republic, I need to say things the way they are. I don't want to have controversy, but the president of the Republic comes 2.5 years later, late to, 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 to talk about these crimes and to go after those who are after uh, deforestation, those that want to have and take uh, land for themselves and they use cattle and African palm and illegal crops in a lesser proportion, but significant still to take hand, take lands from themselves for themselves and have inc income out of those activities. I have mentioned it many times. There is a political force that has political representation in Congress they sustain that cattle and palm economy represented in very clear interests by associations. They have direct representation in Congress. I'm not going to go here in controversy to name people, but you know who I am talking about. So the logics, how they have taken land for themselves has generated debate and we cannot agree. As a result, we cannot agree on basic things to defend the environment. With the government, with the administration, we have come close. We have some common ground. Incredibly, since there was the change in a minister, uh, it, it, political negotiation was hard for the previous minister, but this minister, the new minister, does not know so much about environment, but he does know about politics. So he has come to agreements, like a Cruz vice minister, minister vice minister Cruz. They do understand environmental dynamics, so we have been able to come to agreements. So we, there is no, let's say, that base that can make everyone agree. Uh, all parties, probably there is no, th that need has not been expressed so that all parties agree that uh, def defending the environment is a common cause, but the administration is speaking a lot more today than uh, in uh, Santos administration or in the first part of Duque administration. So, we would have to look at those minimum com uh, the minimum common ground we all parties should come to an agreement thank you so much we have a question for olga in the chat luis felipe asks her what is the prosecutor's office position about the creation of an environmental specialty and ratification by the state uh, uh, in terms of this Casua agreement? About the first question, like I said at the beginning, environmental jurisdiction is fundamental. The prosecutor's office conducted training last year for judges environmental training. We believe that it is key that the judicial operator have a knowledge. This is technical and complex topics that require this specialty. Besides knowledge by the judicial operator, that jurisdiction needs to get to territories. The main user of environmental justice is there in territories, not in high courts, not in big municipalities, but we need to see how to get to territories so that there is access to justice that is easier for people in territories. And about Escazú. The previous prosecutor back then um, send, uh, yeah, they, 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 they asked the government to ratify it. The prosecutor's office is the main actor in terms of citizen representation. So 
these instruments, citizen participation instruments in environmental manners is, are, are absolutely key. So, so it was a clear position about the need of ratifying this agreement. I don't know if the question was answered. Thank you. Gloria Estela, I have two questions for you. The first one is also from Felipe Guzman. The Superior Council Judicature has resources in the short term to implement how many? I cannot hear. And then Ana Maria Talero asks, how long will it take to have the agrarian jurisdiction with the specialized judges in this matter? Thank you for the question. Mr. Lozada, when he presented and he said the opportunity that was lost. So he has the same criteria that, that we had before, right? So we, we had the Supreme Court, so there was one on environmental agrarian specialty because of the identification that we had about that matter. So unfortunately, it was not achieved. We asked Congress to include budget with legislative changes because we found that when a children, child and adolescence law was modified. Well, with their own resources, they, they, they needed to have this adjustment to the specialty to be able to create ju judges uh, for adolescents back then. So we have this project discussing the budget bill. We will be presented before the government so that it is presented the before the government the congress in in july and the idea is to have a agrarian agrarian environmental judges 2020 2022 but we have identified some territories because it is not required in all territories and specifically those territories where we have deforestation where we need to um, take care of, of agrarian and environmental issues, we are going to create judges just as like it happened with land restitution so that we only have three tribunals for land restitution and there are four and that same experience that we had, we're going to apply it to the agrarian jurisdiction or the specialty. So once we see how we're going to do this and then the incorporation for the 2022 budget so we're gonna uh, serve this need we also need to highlight that about the budget for 2021 there is no budget for creating permanent positions so what we do have is the creation of these specialized judges for human right defenders uh, and social ones as well so the protection of these uh, organisms that is not only about uh, human rights but in the environment as well. For this year we have the creation but not for those judges that are related to deforestation, whatever is related to land and what is related to those crimes as it was well explained by Mr. Lozada those criminal groups that do this, I mean, the, that is their business. Deforestation is a business for criminal bands. And to assist those needs in specific regions, that's the idea for 2022, to create environmental judges. Once a law is issued or passed, because of the analysis that we have in land, we have already identified those regions for agrarian judges. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have another comment from a participant. It said that yesterday, the one in, in the natural, natural 
National Park, they talked about that the document they prepared for um, the special, the peace special, uh, um, they about those crimes. That's that's for everyone. I don't know. They were expelled from national parks. So the question is, what is the answer from the general attorney's office, the superior council, the ministry of environment, and the risks probably Gloria Stella would like to talk to us about this, about judges for social leaders, especially like judge, judges. We need to see and have two clear circumstances. When, when we talk about judging and when when there is imputation and of a crime and there is a social leader or human resources leader that's a crime and competence for specialized judges but when imputation we don't identify that it's a social leader or human rights defender then it goes to circuit judges so in this creation that we're gonna have this year, 2021, last year we created 11 specialized judges so that they can see all everything. I'm giving priority to those that I created so that they can have all those that victims are leaders or human rights defenders. And they, they comprise those um, organizations that are dedicated to environment protection. So this concept of social leader and human rights defender goes into that concept. First of all, we are also responding to that and that's why we created this process for visibility and respond to that claim to respond to those crimes against human rights defenders. But we also find that difficulty and we are doing this in all regions, especially in Cauca, as we know, these are the regions that have this issue the most, Cauca. There are leaders there, indigenous leaders. The presentation by Gloria about this topic of the indigenous leaders and the defense of the land and the appropriacy of the land or the relation between the land, the role of development, environment and peace building and the indigenous leaders, the obligation the state has to protect them. So that's what we're doing in Cauca, where we see more difficulties. We created specialized judges in Cordoba as well, one in Antioquia, also in Norte Santander, where there were some also difficulties. And again, like I said, we created difficulty to create these positions for judges. They deserve special attention since they are not identified as social leaders, as defenders of human rights. The process was for a, a normal judge. And we have identified now, but we are trying to appoint judges there to respond to those cases as a priority and lead those processes as a priority and to give it more speed to provide the population and our organization a better response, a timely response. I just wanted to say that that's what the CSJ has done. And from the previous administration also this year, we hope to do this. We hope that for half this year, we have appointed more judges and they have started working to guarantee the proper investigation and support this project that we're talking about to um, treat deforestation properly. I don't know when the definition will be ready. I think it's a bill now, right? Tell us uh, what stage is it at? I couldn't tell. This bill will be discussed this Tuesday. It's first in the agenda for the second debate on the, the plenary of the Chamber of Representatives. So we hope that before this 
legislate legislature ends in june it will go through a two debates because we already have the approval of five ministries ministry of mining ministry of environment ministry of justice ministry of interior and ministry of defense so when there's so many ministries behind a project well in the end that ends up being kind of an avenue for it so let's hope that the government will give us a hand there for the debates to take place when they are scheduled okay we also hope that they will welcome the recommendations, the observations, what we suggested as the state council and as the chamber. We all agree on the same points. So it'll be a successful project. And also in the application of the norm, it'll be easier for judges. It'll be more coherent for judges to apply it. So what I could say, and that's the work we're doing and that's commitment, our commitment is that that this regulation will be passed and we'll start with this specialty. It's a key topic of our interest to provide a response to conservation and the obligation we have to the environment. Thank you. Carl, do you have any additional question for the panelists or any other comment to make? Uh, I do not. This has been incredibly interesting and I, I know everyone is, <laughs> has other things to tend to, including uh, improving environmental governance in Colombia. So I appreciate, we appreciate the time that everyone has taken and um, uh, Miguel, do we, um, do we want to close now? Do you, uh, we have a few uh, closing announcements, I believe. Yes, an important announcement is to uh, acknowledge and thank, very big thanks to the scientific committee that helped prepare the academic agenda for yesterday and in general terms uh, to put this process together. I mean, yesterday was an academic journey and the policy dialogue and today we'll have a more closed dialogue with judges and magistrates. I wanna thank Anna, Heather, Christina, Aristotle, uh, everyone, Catherine, all of them, all the people who have supported in the um, preparation of this event, a lot of work behind this to be able to confirm and uh, call. So it's very nice to um, be able to thank them and to see you. And I wanna thank the panelists, presenters, Olga, Ole, Juan, Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing with us today. We will be compiling this into a document to keep the main points of these discussions, to see where we find common points between environmental governance for peace, land issues, institutions, uh, institutional issues, citizen participation, capacity building that have consistently, consistently appeared and it's been discussed so widely. We'll be trying to share it through the social, social media and through email with you so that every uh, attendance can receive it and all the panelists can read them read them too. So no further be said, I want to wish you a great afternoon. I want to thank you, Carl, for leading this team and thank you for putting this event together. Thank you so much and a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Big hug. Thank you.